All right, in uh, terms of basic topics in anesthesiology, this uh, lecture is on the evaluation of the patient and preoperative preparation. This lecture was put together by uh, Dr. Michael Mangione. <clears throat> However, due to uh, an unexpected illness, uh, he is unable to present it, and therefore I'm presenting on his behalf. I'm Dr. Philip Adams, and we all wish uh, Dr. Mangione a quick recovery. Uh, Dr. Mangione has nothing to disclose with regards to this lecture, and for that matter, uh, nor do I. So, our areas for review, uh, just a, a quick overview, are going to include the physical examination, especially uh, the airway, laboratory evaluation, and in particular, some of the latest uh, practice advisories and um, and the ASA guidelines for preoperative testing, as well as the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association guidelines for cardiovascular evaluation. We'll touch on the ASA physical status classification. Uh, those first uh, three sections there are uh, kind of more of the theoretical things with uh, practice advisory and guidelines that we'll spend most of the time on. And then uh, toward the end, we'll go over some of the uh, commonly encountered medications in the preoperative, perioperative period. It's a little more concrete, so uh, we can go through that a little more quickly. Uh, so we'll get started here with the physical examination of the airway. Uh, it's definitely one of the most critical aspects of an anesthesiologist's exam. Uh, the Malampati classification is well known amongst uh, numerous providers, but of course something that uh, we're going to evaluate for every patient that we come across. Neck extension, especially in the context of someone who may have had uh, neck pathology or neck uh, spinal fusion type surgery. The thyromental distance, oral opening, and in particular with uh, oral opening, uh, large incisors have been uh, found to correlate negatively with uh, an ease of uh, laryngoscopy or intubation. <clears throat> uh, the presence or absence of teeth, and again, touching on uh, an edentulous patient, patient that might be more easy to perform laryngoscopy and intubation versus, again, someone with large incisors. Also taking into account uh, various congenital abnormalities, uh, micrognathia in particular. And then the history of difficult airway, uh, just taking a asking the patient themselves, but again, it's important to keep in mind the context of which that may have occurred. Something to also consider is uh, the, the difficulty of mask ventilation. Uh, does the patient have a beard? Again, their, their dental status, being edentulous, might make mask ventilation more difficult. Body habitus, such as obesity, large tongue, trauma. Uh, so again, all different things to take into account. To go a little deeper on the Malampati classification, uh, there are uh, class one through four, class one being uh, able to visualize the palate, the fascial pillars, and the entire uvula. Uh, class two airway being the palate, the fascial pillars, and only being able to see the base of the uvula. A class three airway being uh, able to visualize the palate and only some of the pillars, of the fascial pillars, and a class four airway being uh, only able to visualize the palate only. Moving on with the physical exam, uh, the vital signs, critically important, and uh, something that could at times be easy to overlook because unlike the heart and lung exam where you're actually performing it, we're often not uh, obtaining the vital signs ourselves. It might be uh, buried in nursing notes uh, or intake forms. But again, you're able to derive a lot of information from it. A uh, febrile tachycardic hypotension, hypotensive patient could be uh, indicating sepsis, whereas a tachycardic hypertensive patient might be someone in pain or having thyroid dysfunction. All things to take into account uh, in your preoperative evaluation. Uh, with regards to the heart exam, uh, evaluating for rhythm, uh, for murmurs, which could indicate to you valvulopathy. Uh, the pulmonary exam, uh, where you might discover wheezing, uh, rails, crackles, again, all things that could potentially change your management. And also doing these exams, both with a patient upright, um, or did they change if the patient's supine? Some patients uh, on their pulmonary exam might not be able to tolerate lying supine. Uh, a selective neurologic exam, in particular, noting any cranial nerve abnormalities, um, perhaps uh, pupillary discrepancies that might be present preoperatively, certainly things that you would want to document uh, in case there are any changes throughout the course of the procedure, any pre-existing uh, pre peripheral neuropathies, again, wanting to have those uh, documented, whether perhaps it be from diabetes mellitus, um, pre-existing carpal tunnel syndrome, et cetera. 
And then also something to consider if uh, spinal, uh, epidural, any kind of neuraxial technique is to be used. Uh, performing and documenting a lower extremity examination, uh, again, to note any pre-existing uh, paresthesias or motor weakness that might be present prior to your neuraxial block. Moving along with, with that idea as well is an anticipated ease or difficulty of regional anesthesia, uh, especially you know, taking into account a patient's body habitus, if there's infections in the area where uh, you're planning to do your block, or also the ease and or difficulty of uh, positioning the patient, such as perhaps somebody who has a traumatic fracture. Uh, also something to be sure not to overlook is patients presenting with an arteriovenous fistula being sure to uh, palpate for document the thrill within the AV fistula, and then making arrangements to have uh, the proper padding or uh, means to uh, not injure that AV fistula during your case. Uh, moving away from the actual physical exam, uh, we're going to get into the preoperative laboratory evaluation for our patients. Again, uh, these, a lot of this comes from the ASA practice advisory for pre-anesthesia evaluation. These guidelines were most recently updated in 2012. Uh, one of the main things uh, that come from this is the routine preoperative tests do not make an important contribution to the process of perioperative assessment. Selective preoperative tests may assist in making decisions. Current literature is insufficient to definitively determine optimal timing, but within six months is generally acceptable if the medical condition has not changed. Um, kind of the takeaway from this is essentially that the arbitrary testing or uh, using arbitrary age cutoffs uh, for uh, whether or not you order certain uh, labs or tests, are, they're no longer endorsed by the American Society of Anesthesiologists. It's a lot more patient pertinent uh, factors that uh, come into account. Um, things like hemoglobin, coagulation studies, serum chemistries, urinalysis. Uh, what we see from these m latest practice, advi uh, latest guidelines is that the large majority of consultants and ASA members surveyed recommend testing only in selected patient population. So what we'll do now is we'll break those down and uh, kind of go through them one by one. With regards to preoperative hemoglobin assessment, uh, the guidelines say that this is not indicated routinely. Uh, the extremes of age, very young or very old, would be uh, an indication to consider testing. A history of anemia, bleeding, or hematologic disorders. Uh, history of liver disease is something that's mentioned, uh, and also to take into account the invasiveness of the procedure and uh, to think about the likelihood of potential blood loss. Again, with coagulation studies, anyone with pre-existing bleeding disorders, uh, things such as von Willebrand's disease, hemophilia, um, should uh, have preoperative coagulation studies evaluated. Uh, patients with renal dysfunction, whereby uh, even Things such as uremia can definitely affect uh, platelet function. Patients with liver dysfunction uh, should have coagulation studies to evaluate for clotting factors. Um, and especially uh, patients coming to you on anticoagulant medications. There's insufficient data uh, from these guidelines to comment on the advisability prior to uh, regional anesthetic. They do mention that. With regards to serum chemistries, patients with endocrine disorders, um, patients with renal dysfunction, and those uh, taking certain medications, uh, such as uh, ACE inhibitors or beta blockers that can have effects on potassium, uh, diuretics as well, uh, altering some electrolytes. With regards to urinalysis, these guidelines state that it's not indicated except in the presence of urinary tract symptoms or for specific procedures, and for those they state um, prosthetic placement or urologic procedures. With regards to uh, implants, it's not routinely indicated in the absence of symptoms. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is uh, urine chemistries may be helpful if a patient presents to you with any kind of unexplained renal impairment or electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, obtaining urine electrolytes could uh, lead you in the direction of etiology for those electrolyte or renal derangements. Pregnancy testing, with regards to this, a higher percentage of uh, ASA members and consultants recommend testing 
all patients, a lower percentage believe testing is not necessary. Um, they believe the indications are uncertain pregnancy history or a history suggestive of current pregnancy. Uh, basically what it comes down to, they state that any female childbearing age in which it could change management, which I take to believe uh, elective versus something such as trauma where uh, it's not when someone needs the surgery they need it. However, if it's something that's elective and it's a woman of childbearing age, obviously that would change your management where you might uh, recommend postponing any kind of elective procedures until after uh, the pregnancy has ended. Next we'll talk about uh, electrocardiography. Again, this is something now that's re um, recommended only in selected patients. Um, the majority believe that obtaining an EKG within six months is sufficient for most patients. There used to be, again, the uh, kind of arbitrary age cutoffs with which they recommended uh, anyone older than X age receive an EKG. But again, this isn't the case. Um, what they recommend now is certainly patients with advanced age, any history of uh, cardiovascular disease, <clears throat> and patients with respiratory disease as well. Getting into chest x-ray, 90% agree testing in select patients, uh, whereas 7% believe testing is not necessary. The range of acceptable time frames is split evenly between one month and one year, kind of a, a broad, uh, open time range. And they recommend it for recent upper respiratory tract infection, smoking, COPD, or cardiac disease. But again, this needs to be taken in the context of uh, what they recommend is Patients with stable COPD, stable cardiac disease, um, that's not considered unequivocal indications. Uh, th these patients who are well compensated and have not had any recent changes uh, in their baseline status. So with that, now we're going to move a little deeper into the cardiac risk stratification and uh, some of the more involved cardiac workup testing. In uh, 2014, we have our latest guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. With regards to active cardiac conditions, they consider unstable angina or angina at rest, acute or recent myocardial infarction, decompensated heart failure, which again would be an acute change um, with regards to the NYHA heart failure status. again. Uh, NYHA class 1 heart failure being no limitations, class 2 being patients who are fine at rest but have some slight limitation in physical activity, class 3 heart failure being patients who are fine at rest but have marked limitation in their physical activity, and class 4 heart failure being patients who have symptoms of heart failure at rest. So uh, again, a recent uh, or acute decline in their heart failure status patients with significant arrhythmias, and patients with severe valvular disease. Uh, any of these should result in delay of elective procedures until uh, they can be evaluated and treated. Again, risk factors, things like smoking, hypertension, family history, myocardial infarction within 60 days prior to non-cardiac surgery in the absence of coronary intervention presence of clinical heart failure or a history of heart failure, things to uh, perhaps investigate or peripheral edema, orthopnea, um, new dyspnea on exertion. And if an echocardi or, I'm sorry, yeah, a uh, echocardiogram is present, uh, an ejection fraction of less than 30%. We have uh, now revised cardiac risk index. Uh, Goldman created the first class of cardiac risk index and then Lee went on then to revise those to determine preoperative risk. Uh, these are simple, validated, and accepted tools for uh, the assessment of perioperative risk of major cardiac complications. Uh, these are defined as myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, or complete heart block. These uh, criteria include six predictors of risk for major cardiac complications, and patients are felt to be at risk, uh, increased risk with two or more of those predictors. Those predictors include a creatinine greater than two, heart failure, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, 
intrathoracic, intra-abdominal, or supra-inguinal vascular surgery, history of uh, CVA or TIA, and history of ischemic heart disease. And by ischemic heart disease, uh, having had a myocardial infarction, a positive stress test, patients on nitrate therapy, or patients with pathological Q waves on EKG are all considered to um, be uh, you know, positive for ischemic heart disease. And looking at each of these uh, six predictor points, patients who have zero are felt to be at 0.4% risk of major cardiac complications. Again, those major cardiac complications being cardiac death, non-fatal MI, or non-fatal cardiac arrest. Patients with one of the predictors are uh, said to have a 0.9% risk. Again, uh, getting to that, uh, having two risk factors, that increases your risk from 0.9 to 6.6%. Anyone having greater than or equal to three of these predictors that is at an 11% uh, risk of major cardiac complications. For patients with elevated risk and excellent functional capacity, meaning greater than 10 METs, um, no further testing is needed. However, for patients with elevated risk and poor functional capacity, less than four METs, or often what we refer to as the equivalent of uh, two flights of stairs, non-invasive stress testing is reasonable, again, if it will change management. For patients with elevated risk and moderate to good, meaning kind of the gray zone, the greater than four, but less than 10, uh, it may be reasonable to forgo further testing and proceed to surgery. Routine non-invasive stress test is not useful for patients undergoing low-risk non-cardiac surgery. With regards to cardiac catheterization, in general, the indications for cardiac catheterization are the same as in the non-operative setting. Uh, excluding transplant evaluation. Revascularization is recommended in circumstances where it would be recommended in the absence of surgery. Routine revascularization is not recommended to reduce risk prior to non-cardiac surgery. In other words, <clears throat> it, there's no rec it's, it's not recommended to pursue catheterization and stenting uh, just for the sake of, say, having a patient uh, who is requesting a total knee replacement. Uh, it's not recommended to, to send them to the cath lab just for the sake of being able to move ahead with their total knee replacement. However, if you're evaluating a patient for a total knee replacement, and during that evaluation they're giving you signs or symptoms of angina at rest, decreased functional capacity, uh, this might be reasonable to uh, refer these patients for further testing. Again, with the notion that this is a circumstance where it would be recommended to pursue this evaluation even in the absence of surgery. There's some changing recommendations for patients with valvular disease. Patients with clinically suspected moderate or greater degrees of valve stenosis or regurgitation should undergo echocardiography if there has been no echo within one year or if there has been a change in the clinical status. And the things that uh, we'll be looking for with regards to stenoses are the gradients that are present, uh, the valvular areas, and whether or not there's been any changes to those. And with regards to insufficiencies, uh, looking at the regurgitant fraction, vena contracta, other means of uh, determining the degree of insufficiency, uh, valvular insufficiency. For patients with indications for valvular intervention on the basis of symptoms and the degree of valve disease, valvular in intervention before elective non-cardiac surgery is effective in reducing perioperative risk. Something to consider though is patients who do go for uh, valvular intervention may then be placed on some type of anticoagulant medication. And again, just something to keep in mind. Elevated risk elective non-cardiac surgery with appropriate perioperative hemodynamic monitoring is reasonable to perform in patients with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, asymptomatic severe mitral stenosis if valve morphology is not amenable for percutaneous intervention, asymptomatic severe mitral regurgitation, 
asymptomatic severe aortic regurgitation with a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. I think the key point to take away and the thing that you see over and over again is asymptomatic patients who are well compensated with their valvular disease. Moving on to arrhythmias, the presence of an arrhythmia should prompt investigation into the underlying cause. Asymptomatic ventricular arrhythmias, including couplets and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, are not associated with an increase in cardiac complications after non-cardiac surgery. And again, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia being, um, although there's numerous definitions, uh, well accepted is three to five consecutive beats originating below the AV node, but less than 30 seconds in duration. Uh, so again, uh, couplets, non-sustained VTAC, uh, <clears throat> not associated with increase in cardiac complications after non-cardiac surgery. Clinically stable patients with a history of atrial fibrillation do not need modification of their management or further evaluation in the preoperative period. This is excluding appropriate adjustment of anticoagulation. And again, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but as always, you should refer to the uh, ASRA guidelines for anticoagulation um, should any type of regional anesthesia anesthetic be planned. The presence of intraventricular conduction delays, including bundle branch blocks, rarely lead to progression to complete AV block. Again, uh, this should be taken into the context of uh, any type of invasive monitoring, in particular PA catheters that you might use uh, with regards to patients with pre-existing left bundle branch block, whereby uh, having four material uh, within the right side of the heart can uh, at times then lead to uh, untoward effects. Elective non-cardiac surgery can be considered 180 days after drug-eluting stent placement, but should ideally be delayed 360 days. Uh, the recommendations used to be six months was fine. Um, we're getting a little more conservative now with the time frame that uh, we don't want any of their patient, any, any of our patients being off of their um, dual antiplatelet therapy at least for one month now. Non-cardiac surgery, which will require stopping dual antiplatelet therapy, should be delayed 30 days after bare metal stent placement and 12 months after drug eluding stent placement. With regards to beta blockade in the perioperative period, it should be continued in patients who are already taking beta blockers. It may be reasonable to begin them in patients with intermediate or high risk predictors, preferably greater than one day prior to the procedure. Alpha-2 agonists, such as clonidine, are not recommended for the prevention of cardiac events. And ACE inhibitors may be continued. If held, they should be restarted as soon as clinically feasible. Patients on statin therapy. Statins should be continued in patients already taking statins and scheduled for non-cardiac surgery. Perioperative initiation of statins is reasonable in patients undergoing vascular surgery. Uh, so now we're going to change directions a little bit and uh, move into the ASA uh, physical status classification. This was last approved by the ASA House of Dele Delegates on October 15th, 2014. ASA class 1, normal healthy patient. ASA class 2, a patient with mild systemic disease. Uh, some examples are current smoker, social alcohol drinker, pregnancy, obesity, well-controlled diabetes or hypertension, mild lung disease. So a diabetic patient perhaps taking metformin only with a uh, reasonable hemoglobin A1C would be considered an ASA2, whereas a patient on uh, two or three oral antihyperglycemics with a hemoglobin A1C of 10 or higher um, might fall more into the ASA class 3 range, which is patients with severe systemic disease, 
um, or poorly controlled disease, poorly controlled diabetes or hypertension, someone on numerous antihypertensives still with um, elevated blood pressures, patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, patients with morbid obesity, active hepatitis, alcohol dependence or abuse, implanted pacemakers, moderate reduction of ejection fraction, end-stage renal disease, undergoing regularly scheduled dialysis, premature infants or a post-conceptual age less than 60 weeks, a history of recent myocardial infarction, uh, but greater than uh, three months from uh, the current evaluation, history of cerebral vascular accidents or transient ischemic attacks, or patients with coronary artery disease and stents. Patients with an ASA class four are those with severe systemic disease that's a constant threat to life. That being myocardial infarction that had occurred within three months, uh, CVAs, TIAs, coronary artery disease and stenting, ongoing cardiac ischemia or severe valvular dysfunction, severe reduction of ejection fraction, sepsis, DIC, ARDS or end-stage renal disease not undergoing regularly scheduled dialysis. And an ASA-5 patient would be a moribund patient who is not expected to survive without the operation. These are those who are thought, regardless of whether or not they have the procedure, um, are likely to succumb to uh, whatever it is that's got them to this point. In particular, uh, or as examples, of ruptured abdominal or thoracic aneurysms, massive trauma, intracranial bleeds with mass effect, ischemic bowel in the face of significant cardiac pathology or multiple organ system dysfunction. Class six patients are those declared brain dead uh, who are presenting for organ procurement. And of course there's the uh, E modifier uh, to indicate emergency surgery, which is defined as existing when delay in treatment of the patient would lead to significant increase in the threat to life or body part. So um, to this point, we've uh, discussed performing our H&P, the airway exam, um, ordering indicated labs and preoperative tests, assessing cardiac risk, and assigning a physical status. Uh, these are all things that can be uh, done uh, days or weeks ahead of time that can be done in pre-op clinic, but now we're going to move on to things that are going to happen more um, at the time of the procedure and uh, or the day of surgery. And to begin with that, we'll start with the practice guidelines for um, preoperative fasting and NPO. Um, clear liquids, the recommendation is for at least two hours. Clear liquids include water, fruit juice without pulp, carbonated beverages, tea, coffee without milk. Um, however, these do not include alcohol. Uh, what's commonly said is um, any type of liquid with which you can read the newspaper through. Um, studies show smaller gastric volumes and higher pH values comparing fasting times of two to four hours versus patients who have been um, without clear liquid ingestion for greater than four hours. Breast milk uh, carries with it a recommended fasting period of at least four hours. Infant formula or, uh, has a recommended fasting period of at least six hours. And a light meal or non-human milk, uh, again, recommended for at least six hours. Um, a light meal is uh, not getting you know, a, a fast food extra value meal and not eating the fries, eating the burger only, that doesn't constitute a light meal. A light meal is things like a piece of toast, a cracker or two. Uh, so very light meal is uh, the recommendation being six hours. And then certainly any meal that includes fried or fatty foods, recommend fasting for at least eight hours as this will decrease gastric emptying time. Um, and with that being said, all of these um, have to be taken with the consideration to uh, each patient and gastric emptying patients uh, on opioid therapy with diabetic gastroparesis or trauma patients, pregnancy, all may have delayed gastric emptying 
Uh, so again, all those things have to be taken into account. There's other other uh, controversial things where there is no uh, true recommendation. Things like chewing gum, uh, chewing tobacco. Uh, how long do we wait for those patients? Is chewing gum considered? clear? Is it considered solid? Uh, and for that matter, what if the patient swallows the gum itself? Uh, again, these things are uh, discussed, but no, tr uh, no formal uh, guidelines or advisory from the ASA has been uh, created. With regards to gastrointestinal stimulants, gastric acid reducing agents, antacids, and antiemetics, the routine use of these agents to decrease the risk of pulmonary aspiration in patients who have no apparent increased risk for pulmonary aspiration is not recommended. The combination of multiple agents is likewise not recommended. For patients at risk, the goal is decreased gastric fluid volume and increased gastric pH. Medications such as H2 receptor antagonists, those being cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, they reliably increase pH but do not affect gastric fluid volumes. And they need to be given some time prior to the procedure, um, often said at least an hour, to give them time to work and uh, actually uh, have some time to increase the gastric pH. With regards to antacids, they work within minutes and reliably increase gastric pH to above 2.5. However, the gastric, gastric fluid volume is either unchanged or at times increased. Animal studies indicate higher risk with low volumes of acidic fluid compared to higher volumes of buffered gastric fluid. And again, if uh, antacids are being entertained as a preoperative medication to be given, um, non-particulate antacids uh, certainly should be all that are used. Omeprazole, a proton pump inhibitor, reliably increases gastric pH when given 30 to 40 minutes preoperatively. Uh, however, within uh, our practice guidelines, both ASA members and consultants disagree that PPIs be uh, used routinely. So again, uh, only in patients uh, with uh, indication for proton pump inhibitor therapy uh, should be given them preoperatively and they should not be used routinely. With regards to postoperative nausea and vomiting, again, risk factors being female gender, a history of postoperative nausea or vomiting, patients who are non-smokers, and patients with preoperative uh, use of opioids. Medications such as pervenazine, dexamethasone, ondansetron are all good agents uh, with regards to preventing post-op nausea and vomiting. Some people believe that uh, patients with motion sickness could also potentially be at increased risk. So other ma medications such as scopolamine, a scopolamine patch that can be applied preoperatively can also be beneficial. But again, you have to weigh the risks and benefits of uh, each of these agents. Again, scopolamine having central anticholinergic effects. Uh, some more recent evidence that the um, 5-HT3 inhibitors on Dancitron, Granisitron, um, similar to uh, Droperidol, which carries the black box warning, uh, these 5-HT3 inhibitors also have the potential for QT prolongation. So uh, certainly something to consider. So again, up to this point, to recap, we've done our pre-op workup. Um, we've evaluated our patient's NPO status. Uh, we're going to move more into the um, medication management aspect of our preoperative evaluation. And in particular, right now, we're going to talk about the continuation versus the di discontinuation of uh, chronic medications. Medications that are routinely continued on the day of surgery in the majority of situations include patients on antidepressants and other psychiatric medications, asthma and COPD medications, including maintenance inhalers, uh, patients on oral contraceptive therapy, patients' cardiac medications, and we'll go into more detail uh, with regards to cardiac medications in the next few slides, and medications for gastroesophageal reflux. Medications that are routinely continued on the day of surgery in the majority of situations 
opioid analgesics, especially uh, chronic pain population, patients who are on long-term maintenance opioids. Um, these patients might present with uh, fentanyl transdermal patches. They might be on uh, chronic methadone therapy. And again, something for our methadone patients to consider as well is whether or not they've had a recent EKG to evaluate for QT. Patients on anti-seizure medications, these are uh, routinely continued on the day of surgery. Patients on steroid therapy, again, oral or inhaled. And um, this is something that needs to be evaluated preoperatively as these patients may require additional um, stress dose steroid uh, therapy during the procedure. Patients on statins and patients taking thyroid medications. Medications that are routinely discontinued on the day of surgery in the majority of situations. NSAIDs, which are usually recommended to be stopped at least 48 hours prior to the procedure. COX-2 inhibitors, if concern over bone healing, which again, the NSAIDs will affect as well. Um, whereas the COX-2 inhibitors are less likely to have platelet effects than the NSAIDs would. Herbals and non-vitamin supplements often recommended to be stopped 7 to 14 days prior to the procedure as uh, many of these medications can have uh, coagulation effects or blood pressure effects. Methotrexate if patients are at risk of renal failure. Viagra or other similar medications for erectile dysfunctions um, as these can have effects on blood pressure perioperatively. Vitamins, minerals potent loop diuretics, oral hypoglycemics, and regular insulin. Getting into those, uh, some of the cardiac medications like we discussed, uh, the antihypertensive, generally they should be continued. Consider discontinuing ACE inhibitors, especially if taken for hypertension only. Uh, lengthy procedures, procedures with significant blood loss or fluid shifts, Patients on multiple antihypertensives, patients with well-controlled hypertension, um, these are patients to consider uh, holding their <clears throat> ACE inhibitor preoperatively because numerous reports exist of uh, dangerously low and refractory hypotension in patients uh, taking ACE inhibitors on and prior to uh, their procedures. Aspirin is recommended to continue on the day of surgery for patients with known vascular disease or before vascular surgery. Patients with drug eluding stents that have been placed within 12 months. Patients with bare metal stents that have been placed within one month. Before cataract surgery or taken for secondary prophylaxis such as known vascular disease or coronary artery disease. Reasons to discontinue aspirin on the day of surgery. Um, you would want to discontinue it five to seven days prior. And th these are gonna be when the risk of bleeding is greater than the risk of thrombosis. Surgeries with serious consequences from bleeding or when aspirin is only being taken for primary prophylaxis with no uh, diagnosed vascular disease. Clopidogrel or Plavix again, should be continued for uh, anyone with drug-eluting stents that have been in for less than 12 months, for bare metal stents that have been in for less than one month. They can be continued in the perioperative period for patients undergoing cataract surgery, but only if no uh, ball bar blocks are planned. Otherwise, uh, clopidogrel is recommended to be discontinued. Um, and often it's recommended that any elective cases should be held off until uh, any kind of thionopyridine medication can be safely held. Again, really with the drug eluding stents being uh, wanting to delay any elective procedures until that 12 month mark and after the one month mark for the bare metal stents. With regards to insulin, patients with type one diabetes, diabetes mellitus take approximately one-third of intermediate to long-acting insulin, such as neutral protamine hagnorn or their lente insulin. Type 2 diabetes mellitus, 
take up to half of their long-acting agent, such as MPH or 70-30 combinations. And patients with insulin pumps should be recommended to uh, continue at their lowest nighttime basal rate or their sick day rate, um, as these patients uh, are often familiar with these terms and uh, will know to basically put it at its lowest setting. Uh, with regards to the insulin pumps, there's no, uh, again, no true clear consensus on uh, the perioperative management of these. Uh, something to consider is whether there's going to be direct radiation over the area of the pump or whether it'll be in uh, any kind of proximity or within the path of bovi as they've been known to damage these pumps. Um, some of the more recent literature or states that it uh, that they can be used safely uh, during surgery. They should be moved out of the surgical field. So uh, having this discussion with the patient, or certainly at least having them uh, talk with their endocrinologist um, beforehand, if they're going to uh, maintain their insulin pump throughout the duration of the procedure, this is uh, felt to be safe, especially for procedures less than two hours in duration. But certainly these patients need documentation of their pump uh, in the preoperative period, a preoperative blood sugar, the rate at which the pump is, um, is at, and certainly be sure the functionality of the pump. Uh, within the procedure, blood sugar should be checked at least every one hour and certainly in the post-operative period, blood sugar needs to be checked as well. Other pre-medications, uh, medications given for anxiolysis, amnesia, analgesia, post-operative nausea and vomiting prophylaxis, uh, anti-sialagogues, aspiration prophylaxis, prevention of allergic reactions, and attenuation of sympathetic nervous system responses. Um, we'll touch briefly on uh, each of these uh, subheadings now. The routine administration of the same regimen to all patients is no longer utilized. Um, selection of a pre-medication regimen should take into consideration a patient's physiologic condition, their age, coexisting conditions, and post-procedure ambulatory status, such as whether the patient needs to be uh, upright and awake, uh, if they're to be discharged uh, to home after their procedure. Uh, also, you know, their uh, risk for post-operative nausea and vomiting for any kind of outpatient procedure needs to be taken into account. With regards to the physiologic condition, patients with tenuous blood pressure um, or a uh, patients at high risk for things like uh, obstructive sleep apnea, um, patients who would not tolerate any kind of hypoventilation. Extremes of age, again, something to take into consideration, especially with regards to preoperative anxiolysis, such as midazolam in our elderly population. And again, uh, other coexisting conditions. Someone with uh, cardiac disease that you might be entertaining using an anti you have to take into consideration that most of these have anticholinergic effects, which can increase heart rate, which might put these patients with coronary disease at increased risk. More specifically, some pre-medication agents, um, often benzodiazepines, again, as I already mentioned, midazolam is, uh, is commonly used. Opioids, uh, short-acting medications such as fentanyl um, are often used for our patients who present uh, in our preoperative area who are uh, already in pain even prior to their procedure. <clears throat> Dexmedetomidine, an alpha-2 agonist medication, uh, has been shown to be especially beneficial for things like awake fiber optic intubation uh, because of its sedative effects, but its um, lack of effects on uh, ventilation status. Again, H2 blockers, which we already touched on, uh, to be given preoperatively to raise the gastric pH, as well as proton pump inhibitors. Antacids, again, non-particulate antacids. Anticholinergics, again, as we touched on, um, as an anti for uh, preparation for awake fiber optic intubation. And uh, steroids as well, again, wanting to evaluate your patients to see if they've been on long-term long steroid therapy uh, and they might need additional coverage for the, for the procedure. Specific considerations, 
interactions with their chronic medications, adverse reactions, and problems related to specific disease states. Again, some of these things we've already touched upon. Anxiolytics and anticholinergics previously used for their sedative and anti effects. They have no current role as routine pre-medications. Pre-medications, again, anxiolytics, the benzodiazepines. The benefits, anxiolysis, amnesia, minimal cardiac and respiratory depression, a wide therapeutic index, and the low toxicity with few side effects. The risks are excessive or prolonged sedation, delayed recovery, and they don't have any analgesic properties. So again, as we mentioned, our uh, elderly patients, patients um, who are having their procedures on an outpatient basis that uh, you want to wake and alert at the end and able to uh, be able to go home. All these things have to be uh, weighed with regard to uh, pre-medication with benzodiazepines, um, the type and the amount that, that uh, you want to give. Midazolam is the preferred agent due to its short duration, fast onset, and lack of active metabolites, and uh, little irritation with injection. Often recommended is one to two milligrams IV in adults. This has a one minute onset and about a two hour duration. But again, the dose response curve to uh, midazolam is quite variable and uh, is going to be different in a uh, <clears throat> teenager presenting. They might have a much higher requirement, whereas um, our elderly pa population might have a much lower requirement. Uh, if, it's, if it's to be given intramuscularly, again recommended is one to two milligrams in adults. This has about a 10 minute onset time, which will peak in 30 to 60 minutes, and again have about a two hour duration. In pediatric patients, they might have a particularly high level of preoperative anxiety and are often going to be resistant to IV placement um, in the preoperative period. So uh, what's recommended is a half milligram per kilogram of oral midazolam, which has an onset time of about uh, 10 minutes. We usually draw the maximum at about 20 milligrams uh, for the oral uh, midazolam. Also ketamine, four to six milligrams per kilogram can be given uh, orally in conjunction with the oral midazolam and can be used in pediatric patients requiring a deep, deeper level of preoperative sedation. Uh, for the children who are resistant to taking uh, liquid oral medications, or for that matter those who can't, midazolam can also be administered as an intranasal um, preparation. This dosing uh, approaches the IV recommended dosing, which is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. But one thing to keep into consideration to warn parents is that the intranasal preparation of uh, midazolam, it does burn quite a bit. Uh, the good thing is, though, that the kids do get sleepy uh, pretty quickly. And because of the amnesia, often forget about it. Again, with regards to the benzodiazepines, in our geriatric patients. They may be more sensitive to the effects of anxiolytic medications and have increased sedation and uh, ventilatory depression. They may be more likely to have prolonged emergence from anesthesia and post-operative sedation. Things to keep in mind when you're evaluating uh, which type and how much of a preoperative anxiolytic to give to your patients. Erythromycin can decrease meta midazolam metabolism and can cause a significant potentiation and prolongation of its effects. Um, more than just its antibiotic um, indications, erythromycin is also used as a gastric promotility agent. Uh, so patients presenting to the um, GI, the endoscopy suite, you might find that they're on this medication and uh, so this is something to keep in mind. Cimetidine, one of the H2 uh, blockers, it binds to cytochrome P450 and reduces the metabolism of diazepam.
Heparin displaces diazepam from protein binding and increases the amount of free drug. Ethanol, barbiturates, and other CNS depressants may potentiate benzodiazepine effects. And uh, this is especially true with acute intoxication, whereas uh, patients with chronic use uh, may actually uh, have a higher requirement of uh, preoperative benzodiazepines. Also, the combination of opioids and benzodiazepines may cause vasodilation and an exaggerated drop in blood pressure, uh, as well as alter a patient's CO2 response curve. Uh, each individually certainly will have an effect, but when given in combination, uh, it can, can, le can lead to profound ventilatory depression. Dexmedetomidine, again, something we uh, briefly touched on. It's a selective alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. Again, very similar to clonidine, but with a higher affinity for the alpha-2 receptor, less affinity for the alpha-1 receptor. This results in sedation and anxiolysis. Does not cause ventilatory depression. It may cause bradycardia and hypotension. The absence of ventilatory depression makes it a particularly useful drug for sedation for awake intubation in patients with difficult airway. Diphenhydramine, histamine receptor antagonist with sedative, anticholinergic, and antiemetic properties. A 50 milligram dose will last three to six hours in an adult. Again, something to, that, uh, again, we touched upon is to consider a patient's underlying disease state and uh, understanding that someone uh, that, that diphenhydramine is going to cause tachycardia and again may not be the best choice in someone with an unstable cardiac status. Premedications with opioids, historically morphine and meperidine were frequently used as preoperative medications. They're typically not given as a premedication unless there is a need for preoperative analgesia or for patients with pre-existing pain. Perhaps someone presenting with uh, an acute fracture or uh, an acute intra-abdominal pathology. Risks include decreased ventilation, orthostasis, delayed gastric emptying, nausea, and pruritus. And again, with regards to delayed gastric emptying, we discussed this in the NPO portion that uh, it can certainly have an effect on those times and should be taken into account. Acetaminophen, uh, no side effects or sedation. 1,300 milligrams orally of sustained release can be given preoperatively. 1,000 milligrams IV for patients who are unable to take oral medications. Anti-inflammatory medications can be given as a premedication for orthopedic procedures, especially the selective COX-2 inhibitors, uh, such as celecoxib. Again, uh, because the selective COX-2 inhibitors won't have the platelet effects. Uh, this is certainly something that should be discussed with the orthopedic, the sur with the orthopedic surgeon due to the uh, possible effects on bone healing. And uh, so therefore that's a discussion that needs to, be, needs to be had with the orthopedic surgeons. Considerations in specific disease states, obstructive sleep apnea and increased intracranial pressure. Any agents that are going to uh, decrease ventilation and could potentially lead to hypercapnia should be avoided. Thyroid disease, hyperthyroidism for elective cases, patients should be euthyroid preoperatively. And this is something that should be done in conjunction with the patient's endocrinologist. For urgent cases, consider the use of anxiolytics to ameliorate stress, which can precipitate thyroid storm. And again, if a patient is acutely hyperthyroid and needing urgent surgery, other things that can be given are beta blockers, dexamethasone. Uh, those will prevent the peripheral conversion uh, to the active uh, thyroid form, uh, as well as the beta blockers controlling the cardiovascular status. Um, medications such as PTU or propothiouracil can be given, and Lugol solution, which are iodine drops, can be administered, uh, again, all in the kind of emergent uh, or acute phase for hyperthyroidism. On the other end, patients with hypothyroidism, considerations include increased sensitivity to anesthetic agents, delayed gastric emptying, and decreased ventilatory response to hypoxia and hypercarbia.
Um, and again, these patients will often come on levothyroxine or some sort of thyroid replacement, and these are medications that are often continued throughout the um, preoperative and perioperative period. In patients with glaucoma, you should avoid any agents which could lead to um, pupillary dilatation, uh, in particular anticholinergics such as scopolamine, atropine, glycopyrrolate. Chronic steroid use may depress the pituitary adrenal axis. Dose and duration that will cause this is unknown and highly variable. Consider treatment in any patient who has received at least one month of treatment in the last six months. It's often recommended that hydrocortisone, 100 milligrams IV, be given before, during, and after surgery. With regards to patients on inhaled corticosteroids, whether for uh, asthma or COPD maintenance, uh, it is not recommended that, uh, or it's not seen that they need um, a stress dose steroid administration. These are more so for people on chronic long-term oral uh, steroid use. With regards to opioid dependency, drug abuse, or chronic pain, maintain opioids at the usual level to avoid withdrawal. Avoid agonist antagonist preparations, which could precipitate withdrawal. The role of premedications in patients with allergies. First, what needs to be determined are the causes of agents for their allergies in the uh, operative period, neuromuscular blocking agents um, are big culprits, and it's because of the quaternary compounds in these agents. Um, they're very prevalent in, um, in cosmetics, soaps, shampoos. So even without ever having had surgery, patients are, uh, often have the ability to be sensitized to these. Uh, latex, uh, healthcare workers and children with spina bifida, just because of their uh, this was prevalent more in the past when latex was often used and again healthcare workers often exposed to it and children with spina bifida requiring so many procedures and recurrent urinary catheterizations had so much exposure to latex. Um, less so now because we often we have so many latex free items but uh, still something definitely to keep in mind. Antibiotics we often see uh, come up as allergies. The local anesthetics, and in particular ester, ester local anesthetics, such as benzocaine or chloroprocaine, true amide allergies are exceedingly rare. Medication protamine, um, diabetics could have been exposed, those taking NPH insulin. And another uh, big culprit that we often come across is contrast dye. Premedication in patients who must receive uh, a known causative agent, again, such as contrast dye, Preparations are, usually include uh, an H1 blocker, such as diphenhydramine, uh, steroids, but again, they're not particularly effective if given immediately before the procedure. They're often given in a graded fashion, 13, 7, and 1 hour prior to the procedure. H2 blockers may have a role, but uh, definitive evidence is lacking. With regards to antibiotic prophylaxis, the guidelines contain detailed information as to the types of recommended antibiotic agents for specific procedures um, and won't be detailed here. In general, the recommendations for pediatric populations are similar to those for adults, noting that data for pediatric patients is limited and recommendations are extrapolated from the adult data. The routine use of vancomycin is not recommended for any procedure. The use of vancomycin can be considered in patients with known MRSA colonization or those at high risk for colonization. Staph aureus is the most common pathogen causing surgical site infections, and roughly a fourth of patients are colonized. Preoperative screening and decolonization may reduce infection risk in cardiac and orthopedic patients. Cephalosporins can be safely used in patients with a penicillin allergy that is not a true IgE-mediated reaction, such as anaphylaxis, urticaria, or bronchospasm. In general, administration of the first dose of antimicrobial is recommended within 60 minutes before surgical incision. The administration of vancomycin and fluoroquinolones should begin within 120 minutes of surgical incision. And uh, therefore, these are things that, again, you may be starting uh, in the preoperative holding area. With regards to um, endocarditis, the American Heart Association's most recent uh, revisions came out in 2007. 
It's primarily recommended only for dental procedures involving the roots and gums. The respiratory tract, if it involves mucosal incision or surgery on infected tissues, is recommended only for the highest risk patients. Those patients are considered to be those with artificial heart valves or other prosthetic material in the heart, certain congenital cardiac defects, a history of endocarditis, or heart transplant patients with acquired valvular disease. So although the uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is something that, uh, again, is given intraoperatively or at least immediately before uh, incision, it's often something that's going to need to be considered, uh, again, in the preoperative period with regards to what is going to be needed um, in patient allergies. Um, so with that, that uh, concludes this portion of the, uh, of the review on the evaluation of the patient and preoperative preparation. Thank you.